Good evening. Woo. Great to see you all. Uh, I just want to uh, welcome you. I'm uh, Andrew Smith. I'm the pastor here at the Presbyterian Church, and uh, it's been a, a privilege and a delight for us to be hosting these uh, speaker series talks over the last number of months, and uh, I want to say thank you to Kennet Collaborative for asking us to do this. Uh, we've been delighted to be the host. We're multitasking today, as I'm sure you saw on the way in. We're a polling station downstairs. We've got the speaker series upstairs. So uh, just uh, some practical matters. If you need some restrooms, uh, you can just go out these doors and down the hall. If you need a drink of water, there's a little kitchen there as well. Uh, but you're very welcome. I'm going to hand over to Bo, and he is going to introduce the speaker. Thank you, Andrew, and thanks once again to PCKS for letting us use this space. Uh, I want to start off with a huge thank you uh, to McElroy Harvey for sponsoring uh, tonight's event. Um, so let's give a round of applause for them. Uh, and a, a few things. So this is our uh, fifth talk in this series, the speaker series we've been doing. Um, Kinnick Collaborative also has a number of other events going on in the community. I think there's stuff on the back uh, table about this, but we have a summer fest event coming up that's June 12th. Uh, it's a kind of wine and art inspired event. Uh, so make sure to check that out and purchase tickets for that. Um, and we have third Thursday this week coming back to Kennett Square. So make sure you make reservations at some of those restaurants. Um, I'm very excited for tonight. Again, this is our, our fifth talk. I think this is one I'm most excited about. Very excited about tonight to have someone uh, whose work I have admired for a really long time. Our last talk was on placemaking and cultivating places of beauty, and I can't think of anyone better to follow that presentation than Steve Nygren. Steve has created one of the most beautiful and magical places in America from scratch. I use the word magic, magic to describe uh, the types of places that we can build, and a lot of times people say, let's find a different word than magic. Like, what, what's a more descriptive word? And I go back to magic because I've experienced a place like Serenby. Uh, and if you go there, that's the feeling that you get. Um, Steve's gonna show some images tonight, but take it from me as someone who's experienced it, the images will not do justice uh, to the, the feelings of serenity, awe, and inspiration that comes from walking around Serenby. Serenby was built to inspire and create a sense of awe a series of urban villages nestled into the undulations of preserved forests and meadows, a place where sustainable agriculture, beautiful architecture, and nature meet to cultivate community among residents. If you think this sounds like a utopia, you're not the first person to think that. In fact, mo the, the, one of the most common questions uh, Steve has shared that people that experience Airbnb, people that walk around for the day, the first question they ask is, is this real? Is this place real? But Steve calls it common sense. He says these places should exist it's the way we built places hundreds of years ago, or a hundred years ago. So to tell the story of Serenby and to help us imagine how we might build places of all, I'd like to welcome Steve Nygren. Well, thanks, Bo. That was great. And uh, so are there any questions? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I can uh, uh, top that. Uh, and, and, and yeah, that's the, that, that's the amazing thing, Bo, is everyone goes on and wants to know if it's a cult or for real or utopia. And, and uh, the truth is, um, it's like we built communities 100 years ago before we had so many regulations that we can't build great places anymore. Um, and uh, everything you see at Serenby, when we started 20 years ago, 50% of what you see uh, wasn't allowed at the time. We had to change the zoning. We had to... Uh, get exceptions, and we had to break the law when we had to uh, do the right thing. Uh, so it, it was kind of, I was a maverick, you know, and people accuse me of, you know, preaching, and so I think this is the first time I've actually had a church to uh, <laughs> d deliver this message in, you know. Uh, th so that's great, but I'll, I'll try not to go over there. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's always curious, who's here? How many of you were born here? Raise your hands high. Wow. How many of you have lived here more than 30 years? Wow. How many more than 20? So we're getting down a bunch of newbies. How many have moved here since the last five years? So a, a, a great mix. 
Well, that, that's, that, that's what happens in community. That, that, that was very much uh, what, what uh, we found in, in our community. So this is, I'm really a hospitality guy. Uh, you know, I, I started out in architecture at the University of Colorado, uh, was seduced into hospitality through summer jobs, uh, worked for Stouffer's Food Corporation for uh, several years. In fact, I, I became part of their, their management team and uh, part of their hotel opening team. And uh, they moved me to Atlanta, Georgia to, to open a hotel. Uh, and I fell in love with Atlanta and stepped off the treadmill uh, to open a restaurant so I didn't have to leave. Um, and uh, that was 1972. Yeah, I've earned all this gray hair. And uh, uh, so I built uh, this restaurant company, a great restaurant. In fact, we had a couple of restaurants in Philadelphia, so that's uh, up into this area. Heavy in Washington, D.C., uh, a lot in Atlanta. And uh, so I was on, you know, the treadmill of life. Had the, uh, the great house in the right neighborhood of Atlanta uh, to where I could walk uh, two blocks one way to Symphony Hall and the High Museum and all the restaurants on Peachtree Street and three blocks the other way to the city's park and the botanical gardens. And, and uh, we, we, it, it was a great house. Uh, 1905, we restored it. Three daughters um, bought all those things that we knew were the trappings uh, that I didn't have when I grew up on the farm in Colorado. Uh, and, and, and life was great. And then uh, one day, my wife saw on the back of the Georgia Preservation newsletter that there was a historic farm for sale uh, outside Atlanta. And I couldn't believe that there was really open land within 25 minutes of the airport. Um, and with three small children, the, the girls were three, five, and seven. You're always looking for something to do. So uh, I called and clarified that we weren't interested in buying anything, but we were going to take a drive. And did they have any farm animals? And would they mind if we pulled in uh, to show the kids the farm animals? And of course, anyone with something for sale says, come on. We arrived. They had the Shetland pony saddled, and we bought the farm. I had no idea what that was going to do uh, t to my life. Um, so, um, oh, right, where? Better put my glasses on so I can see what I got to turn on. I, are you sure it's not on? Okay. And. Um, so we rented the historic house out because we certainly didn't need another house to take care of. And I thought we might come out a couple Saturday afternoons a month. And there was a shack in the back. And my wife said, well, I'll fix that in case we ever want to spend the night. Well, to my amazement, it's where the kids and the whole family wanted to come every weekend. They chose to go to the shack instead of Disney World. And doing that every weekend was a real value shift for me. Uh, there we are outside the shack uh, when, when, they, when they were as uh, small as we were going down on the weekends. And what I experienced in those three years, I think, is a lot of what a lot of people have seen in the last couple years through the pandemic, where you really start evaluating what's important to you. Uh, do you like where you live, especially why people were forced to actually live where they lived? Uh, and, you know, huge change in, in, in what people are wanting to do. Uh, it so changed my opinion of what was important in life. And, and I was on, you know, all the, lots of boards, you know, and the health boards, I'm not sure we were making a difference. The arts boards, we had to raise money or they weren't going to be alive in, in two more years, so you're doing all that. Somehow the politicians I was supporting, won't, they weren't getting elected. And it was all these things of frustration. And one Monday morning in January of uh, 94, uh, I was driving back into Atlanta on a Monday morning after we'd had a great weekend. Uh, and there was this pollution sitting over the city. And I could see we were actually driving into it. And I thought, I'm driving my family into pollution in more ways than just the air. And I'm going to step off this treadmill. And so in the next six months, I, <clears throat> I had sold the company. We had 36 restaurants in eight states. Uh, we sold the big house, resigned from most of the boards, and stepped off the treadmill. 
and moved out to the farm and started restoring the 1905 uh, house. If you see pictures of me of those days, you'll see my hair down to my shoulders. Uh, it was really, you know, a freeing experience. Uh, it, it was incredible. Uh, we could t take the kids uh, to Europe for a month. Uh, you know, I, I was very fortunate that at 49, I was able to, to, to retire very comfortably. And uh, I wasn't bored at all. We had lots to do. Put in the, you know, a huge garden and restored the house, put the pool in, put some of the essentials in, but, you know, trying to keep that basic connecting to nature. Years later, Richard Louvre wrote Last Child in the Woods. Have any of you, are you familiar with that? Yeah, and it, it, it resulted in the, the medical community identifying nature deficit disorder. Um, people started sending me the book or telling me about it. And I sent Rich a note and I said, thanks for, for giving voice to what I intuitively knew. And it's that part of our children's brains are not developing. It's the pituitary gland. It's what's associated with common sense. And it stops developing at 23. Professors were noticing some bright kids who were arriving at college. They couldn't figure out simple things. And that's what started the research some years ago. <coughs> um, and so, uh, of course, became very involved then with, with uh, Richard Lube and the Children and Nature Network. But that's hu a huge movement. If you're not familiar with it, if you have kids or grandkids, check it out because it's, uh, it's talking about kids, you know, it, it, they're, they're in such uh, uh, structured social and built environment that's just not developing. I think one of the good examples is a, a bunch of kids, a picture of a bunch of kids, and they're running out in the woods, they're crossing a stream, and there's the rocks, you know, there's not that much water. But the older kids all know where their feet need to hit to get across the stream. And it sort of zeroes in on a three-year-old, and he's standing on the bank, the other kids have gone on, and that expression in his face, and you know he's thinking, can I do that? And Richard Liu says, few kids have that opportunity today, and if they do, there's a parent that picks them up and puts them on the other side. And we're not aware we're depriving them of an essential thing about the actual development of their brain. So th this, I realized what I intuitively knew from my gut and why we moved our family out, and we saw the real difference, and it, it's a huge difference. Um, and so, life was great. And then in my uh, sixth year of retirement, my daughter and I were out on a jog along what was uh, our property line. Uh, we bought the initially 60 acres, then we put the old farm together, uh, and so we were at 300 acres in uh, the end of 1999. And as we were coming up over the hill, the forest next to us was being bulldozed. And I ran out and I said, what are you doing? And the guy said, we've just been hired to uh, clear the trees. I guess they're putting houses in. That's what always happens. And with that, I ran back to the house to call the retired doctor who lived a couple counties over. And I couldn't get him. And I couldn't get him. And um, finally, five weeks later, when he returned from Europe, I found that he'd sold it to a neighbor down the road uh, who wanted to put in a pasture airstrip. Uh, this guy only had about 10 acres down the road. So I never thought to call him when I was trying to figure out what was going on. I was calling all the people with 100 acres or more. And in that five weeks, I had another 600 acres under contract. You know, is that typical, I'm gonna protect my own backyard. I wanna put a fence around it. Uh, how, how do I keep all of those people out? Uh, and here I sat with 900 acres. And even though the development uh, threat was over, I realized that that was just my wake-up call. We were on the edge of Atlanta, and for various reasons, it had developed uh, north, and then west, and then east, and we were sort of the, that, that uh, uh, southwest corridor was the last. There had been no roads down there, no infrastructure. The schools were terrible. And so although we were in Fulton County, uh, which is just a little bit smaller than Chester County, uh, but we were in the southern end. Now, uh, in Fulton County, Atlanta is right in the center. The county's 80 miles long, and we're in the very southern tip uh, of that. So the development had skipped it. Um, but it was obvious that Metro Atlanta was running out of land, and it was about to happen. And uh, I decided we needed to do something. 
that I couldn't just put a fence around 900 acres and I couldn't keep buying more land. Uh, and so uh, we thought we'd put a model. And then I looked at models, whether it's uh, prairie crossing outside Chicago, seaside uh, in Florida, Panhandle. They all attract the kind of development that they're trying to influence change in. And so I realized it's really regulation. People don't do things voluntarily, generally, especially when it's a new idea. And so we needed to talk about regulation. Now, back in my days when uh, my first restaurant was in Midtown Atlanta, I don't know if any of you know Atlanta, but Midtown in the 70s was, was pretty uh, sad. Uh, the hippies had moved in in the 60s, and it was the uh, 10th and Peachtree was the Haight-Ashbury uh, of the Southeast. And when they left uh, uh, at the end of the 60s, uh, there were empty storefronts, uh, and, and so bad that prostitutes were sitting in the windows and drug deals and the weeds uh, along Peachtree Street, the main street. And they would cleaned it up uh, to some degree. Uh, and I had restaurants, at, at, that's where my first restaurant is because I could afford it. Um, and it ended up buying that building. And uh, I had restaurants in both, um, both sides of it. And so I, I became chairman of the Alliance and, and we changed the zoning uh, to be a walkable uh, community back in the 80s. Uh, transformed today, that's some of the highest real estate in Metro Atlanta because there's a master plan to it. Uh, so I, had, uh, I, I, real, I didn't realize that was my training ground uh, with the Woodworth Foundation paying all the professionals to come help us. Um, and so uh, I uh, decided we needed to have a, a community effort. Uh, and so that, that began, who, who was living there? Now in this audience, how many of you would define yourselves as preservationists? Raise your hands high, I see. And how many would consider yourself in the development community? And is there anyone that raised their hands for both? Okay. How's that going? Uh, yeah, generally those are the two groups that end up in court. So uh, I'll be interested in talking to that group, that, that last group that raised your hands to find out how that per split personality, how you're dealing with that from, from time to time. Uh, yeah, yeah you, you, should, we, should we have a focus group over here? You're looking for who else was, was in that group. Uh, but that was one of the challenges a, a, as we set about. And so what were we going to do? Were we going to preserve or develop? Because it seemed like it's one or the other. Um, and I, of course, was interested in, in saving the land because we'd found this paradise on the edge of Atlanta. You know, I still like foreign films and sports and uh, ethnic food, and it was just, you know, 30 to 40 minutes up the road, so I didn't want to move another hour out, which generally happens. Um, and so we were going to put the stakes down and do something about it. Uh, but I called, you know, the, the Nature Conservancy, the Trust for Public Land, the Conservation Fund. They were all busy saving land in front of the bulldozers north and west of Atlanta, and they didn't think we were threatened. And so there wasn't enough threat uh, for them to even um, seriously look at any, you know. They'd meet with me, but explain to me the limited resources. And so I started thinking about, you know, what was the common sense? What, what was this cause, and how can you possibly stay in front of the bulldozer? Now, I understand you all have saved a lot of land. In fact, one of the highest in the country. What is it, 35% maybe? Is that right? 30, how much? 30.2. How much has it cost you? 150 million. Wow. Is that a foundation? You have a, you have a green tax? We didn't have any of those advantages. You know, we were in South Fulton County. Uh, all the foundations, all the money, as I say, they were going other ways. We, we had to figure this out. Um, and it was fairly divided. The inherited landowners, 50% uh, said, bring on the bulldozer. Daddy said, that was payday. We've been waiting for it. And the other half said, don't you touch this land. I want my grandkids to grow up on these same fields and, and forests. 
And so it was a real mix. And then we had a lot of land speculators that had bought land. And then you had people like us who had found this paradise, you know, that had horses and, and various things on. So we had a very divided community to deal with. But I knew we had to do something. So we started having coffee. Um, I called the large landowners. There were two large landowners that had over 1,000 acres. They were about in, in my category. And we had them for dinner. My wife is a great cook. And so after about four months of dinners and several cases of wine, uh, they agreed that maybe we could do something different that was more balanced. Uh, and so I'm feeling good. I, I, uh, now, th th this is 2000. I had just learned how to use Excel and do spreadsheets. And the county had just uh, digitized the tax records. So I was busy sorting to figure out uh, who, who was there and what the size ownerships. And I discovered that there were 36 of us that owned 50% of the 40,000 acres we were focusing on. And so I thought, OK, it's the large landowners that create the change. It's not the small landowners. I have to find out where we are there. And so I had the two largest landowners going along that we could maybe look at some sort of balanced growth idea. Countryside of England was my model because we, had, in, in retirement, we had a dear friend who lived in Selborne, England, um, outside London. And I realized the land laws uh, after World War II really uh, allowed for the country to stay country, and they yet had a lot of people living in the hamlets, villages, and towns. And I want to know how they did that and what it was about. So I really was a, became a student of the English land law uh, uh, as to how that happened, and, and I suggested that we, we look at that. Uh, uh, Randall Arendt uh, had, uh, had written a book, and so a lot of his images were dealing with the same thing. Um, and so I used those to talk. So ha having the two largest landowners, I really felt empowered. So we invited the 36. 30, uh, uh, three of them showed up. Now, we didn't have dinner, but uh, we had a, a big dessert spread. Um, and I called the meeting to an order and uh, out of an end to the meeting in about 90 minutes. Because some of the inherited landowners, those who had grown up together, started actually calling each other names. It was kind of not remind you of sixth grade uh, playground fights. And I thought, oh my god, I've got to figure this out. Uh, uh, this, is, this is disaster. About that time, the Urban Land Institute had done the study on the golf courses. Remember in the 80s and 90s, we had golf courses everywhere? And it was because the bankers loved those golf courses. Why? Because they saw the premiums uh, that those lots that faced the golf course were bringing. But the, but the Urban Land Institute found that 92% of the people who owned those expensive lots played golf twice or less a year. So what does that say? They were buying it for the green space. So I said, wow, OK. If we could get golf course prices without putting a golf course in, wouldn't that make sense? So I thought, OK. And I got some more statistics. And I thought, OK, I've got the, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can call the median again. And so I knew we had this old timer. He, 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 he was 80, uh, awfully close to my age now that I think about it, but he sure felt like an old timer 20 years ago. And, uh, but, and, and he had a voice. And I, uh, and I called Mr. Thompson, and I said, Mr. Thompson, I've got some more information. Would you come back? And he says, no, sir. Nobody's going to tell me what to do with my land. And I said, well, Mr. Thompson, your neighbors, I, I, I know that when, when they die, their kids have left this area because education's bad. And, and they're probably going to sell that land. And by you not participating, you're actually giving them the power on what's going to happen to the land around you. He thought about that for a minute. He said, are you going to have that peach cobbler? I said, yeah. So he said, OK, I'll come. And so I, you know, people came back for the, for the desserts and the food. And we gradually started changing their attitudes of talking about what the concept was. And, and, and where, you know, if you wanted to save it, and if you wanted to, you know, not necessarily develop, but you were worried about the highest value. And how could we do something that could bring both together? And so uh, the Rocky Mountain Institute had heard what we were doing. Dear friend of mine, Ray Anderson, um, uh, had, he was the first industrialist to put his company on a carbon neutral footprint uh, and through interface carpet with the carpet squares. 
Um, and so he asked Rocky Mountain Institute to help. And so they brought, uh, Ray and the Rocky Mountain Institute brought 23 thought leaders to Serenby for two days to talk about a lot of these issues. Now, there were a lot of experts. There wasn't anybody that was really developing. And Ray eventually pushed me into you know, doing a lot of this. Um, and so we brought some of those concepts as, as, as we did those meetings. And they introduced me to Phil Tabb, who did his doctorate on the English village system and was headed to Texas A&M to head the architectural department there. So we invited Phil to help lead a visionary as to what we could do. And that, that was bringing in the, the large landowners. Uh, and we got them uh, to have a vision. But then we rolled that plan up and realized that if we told the other 500 landowners that this is what the large landowners to do, they would know there was something wrong with it. And so we started all over. We got a grant. We hired ECOS as a professional planners to lead a public process. Now about that time, my county commissioner came down, because this was unincorporated Fulton County at the time. He said, Steve, I hear you're causing all kinds of trouble down there. I said, oh, commissioner, this is going to be great. You're going to love it. And he said, uh-huh. He said, the north end of the county, it sounds, they, they want something that sounds a lot like what you're talking about. And he said, by the time they got to the commission chambers six months ago, there were 200 people with ball caps for and 200 with t-shirts against. Steve, don't set me up to where I have to vote against half of my constituents, no matter how I vote. I said, I'll tell you what, Commissioner, we formed the Chattahoochee Hill Country Alliance, and it's $2 an acre to belong. I'll be able to judge our support. If we have more than 30% opposition, I won't bring it before the, the, the chamber. And I said, provided you'll give me your public support and l allow the Fulton County Planning Department to participate with us in these public meetings. We agreed and we set out. Um, now this shows you the, th the maps that were created. So on your left is the large landowner map that came through the charrette that Phil Tab led. And that group said, if you're gonna put development, put it on my land. Then the middle is the public process group. Uh, there was a series of five public meetings, you know, great meetings, the whole process that you do uh, with, with the ideas, the stickers, what have you. We had 230 people showing up to these on an average. They had never had this kind of turnout for any kind of public meeting, maybe 10, 12 people. We had inspired a community to take charge of their own destiny with new ideas. It was a blank slate because the county had agreed that we could throw the existing zoning out and start over if there was something that we could get past. That, that center map is if you're gonna develop not in my backyard. Guess what? <laughs> They wanted the same thing. They just had a different way of looking at it. And then, by the time we got there, of course, we, we had the planning department with us. We didn't realize that all the other counties, and at that point, we discovered that the uh, public works department had flowed a bond to service uh, 40,000 houses in this area with sewer. And so they didn't want this because this, they saw this as a preservation. We're blocking it, and they almost, they, they almost tanked this whole idea. Uh, finally, uh, we, after many meetings, finally we had to get everybody in the room because we'd get one group to say yes and the other group no, and then it would turn around and it was round robin. We finally had 16 people in the room to get an agreement. Um, and so the, the, the map on, on the far right is what the county did, looking at infrastructure, where did it make sense? Well, guess what? The large landowners was near where the future highway was planned to come. It, you know, it all made sense. So here are three maps, basically the same land plan with three complete different filters. And so the whole thing is if, if you get people in a room with a blank slate, a lot of times they'll come up with the same decision. Because, Bo, as you said, it's common sense. If you listen to the land, it's amazing. But it's amazing how many times we end up in court because we're afraid it's going to hurt your land or we react to a plan. You know, too many times when developers come out with a plan, no one suggested what the land should be. It's just we start fighting about what it shouldn't be and rather than all coming together. So we had the pro-development, pro-preservationists all together. Um, and we passed that unanimously uh, in uh, uh, the end of 2002. By the time we took it to the commission, we had 80% of the land paying due. The 20% that didn't support us also never opposed us. Uh, they just stayed home. Uh, I call them the, the, the armchair critics. You know, if you find them on your front porch, 
even though they never attended a meeting because we kept a complete roll call, uh, they'll tell you everything that was wrong with it. But uh, uh, they, they also never, never bother us. So we passed this uh, unanimously. Now suddenly it was my responsibility to show what we could do with that. Uh, and here this shows you what it is. So we had 40,000 acres. If we had gone the old way, we would have disturbed 80% of the land. Now, that was just taking the figures that Atlanta in the 17 county area had done in the last two decades. And so this is just applying that to our 40,000. So we would disturb 80% with about 30,000 houses. By having density, we show that we can save 70% of the land, 70% by moving the density to the 30%. Now there's sort of in, in, in ag zoning, there's the idea that there's one unit to an acre. And so this allowed that for every, for instance, the Hamlet zoning is for every 200 acres, you have to save 70% um, of it, but you move the entire 200 density units to the 30%. So on that 60 acres, you develop it. And so this is, what the zoning called for. Uh, nothing quite like it. Uh, you know, most places, if you can get to, I, I do not know of anywhere in the United States has done more than 50% preservation within a metro developing area. And so this is unheard of. We had to bring transfer development rights in. The state didn't have it. Do you have transfer development rights here? So, kind of. Yeah, well, it, you know, it, 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 it was one of those tools because remember, we, we, we didn't have the availability to a, a, a green tax or a foundation. And so we had to link development with preservation. And this was the way we could do it. And so if, uh, and, and it also helps the small landowners that are generally pushed out because of taxes. So they can actually sell their development rights and move it over to an area that's being developed. So if, if in a hamlet you want to develop your 30% more densely, you can buy development rights from anyone else in uh, the area. And, and, and it really gives a way to monetize that small land developer uh, that, that's pushing out. It makes just a lot of sense. It's one of the great tools that really isn't used in America very much. Uh, Montgomery County uses it. Uh, Boulder County, Colorado, uh, we brought them in to teach well, to educate uh, our uh, state and local officials uh, on what that tool was. And let me tell you, this was a new tool for the South. You know, I grew up in Colorado and they're used to severing mineral rights and water rights. Well, in the South, you either own the land or you don't. Uh, and so this was a real uh, challenge to get through, but, but we did. Uh, and so uh, that, that was a very different uh, method. And, uh, but, but we regulated it and that's how we're developing. Uh, now, the county had agreed, and so we threw out the zoning. And we, because everything we wanted to do wasn't allowed. And so we really, they, they, they hired a, 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 a regulator, a planner. They locked several of us in the room with her for uh, two weeks, and we wrote, rewrote the zoning. Of course, I was the first to apply uh, for all my permits, and uh, I, I couldn't believe it. I was sitting at the table, I had my plan, we were writing, and I had 12 variances I had to apply for. You, you, you realize how crazy it is. Uh, you know, we, we, we were so adamant that we weren't going to allow these strip malls with the parking. We'd forgot that some of the same language affected courtyards and, and uh, retail uh, facing a, a, a courtyard. So uh, <laughs> you can see where the best, best ideas of zoning, you have to have common sense, you have to have variance uh, to, to, to create the kind of places you want. Uh, so that, you know, that's the new way uh, we will uh, put actually 20% more housing on 30% of the land. The old way is all vehicular dependent and the other way, we, it's all mixed use and walkable. It's the way of the future. It's where the analysts, the uh, bankers are now looking at. You know, when we started this, I was so out there, uh, everyone in the development community, some of my friends, they thought I was nuts. They came down wanted to know where the marijuana was because they knew I was growing something out in those woods. Uh, but after the recession, and believe me, we had our struggles coming through the recession, uh, but the uh, analysts were finding that walkable and environmental communities were the first out of the recession. 
So suddenly there was a lot of interest in what we were doing. And you look at what's happening, you look at any of the future statistics, it's gonna be walkable. L look at where uh, the baby boomers are moving to retire into walkable community, and the young people under 30, some, they don't care if they have a car as much. Uh, this is gonna be the, 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 the way of the future. And, uh, so we were way ahead on that. Uh, today, the Chattahoochee Hill Country is 65,000 acres. Uh, the uh, 40,000 of it uh, is now a city of Chad Hills. We petitioned to the state legislature. Um, and we are the first development under these new regulations. All right, now, it, it, who's, who's with city governments or county government? Go who are government people here? Okay, a few. So here, here, here's the key thing, because this is like, you know, a lot of head scratching. Is this going to really work? All right, so the last tax year, well, let me back up another thing. This was so radical that we plain stopped development. For those that are your preservationists, man, this was the most brilliant thing that ever happened. You know, we were allowing development, and nobody knew how to develop. No one thought density was going to pay. Everybody was afraid because they had a model. I call it rut thinking. We know one way to do it. You know, the, the architects, the civil engineers, we have one way. We've forgotten. We're scared the market analysts, you know, and, and, and for developers, all of our bankers look in rear view mirrors, and if you're headed out the windshield, looking through the windshield, it's a rough place to be, it's a lonely place to be. I had to self-fund, thank goodness I believed in Midtown Atlanta, and thank goodness that real estate appreciated because of our zoning, and I was able to use that uh, to self-fund. So I was able to just plow ahead, uh, even though. Uh, but. Okay, now fo follow my math. Uh, Serenby has disturbed 200 acres we've, of our, we, we have about 1,800 acres now, and 40,000 acres. We're the only actual development with, with retail and mixed use and houses. And the last tax year, and not all of that was totally tax paying because a lot of it's under construction, pays 60% of the taxes for a 40,000 acre city with a full-time fire, full-time police, full-time public works, lots of rural roads. And three years ago, we were able to roll the taxes back, the millage rate back. So the farmers and those people with lower income houses, lower prices, actually had lower taxes because we'd brought executive housing in. Too often, we worry about affordable housing and we don't worry about executive housing. It should be a balanced tax base. You should have a line and you need the same number above that line as below it as whatever it costs you to deliver services. And too often, we go one way or the other in, in what we worry about rather than keeping a balanced tax base. Now, we're, we're at that whole area. You know, we're, We've got about 1,000 jobs coming in the next four years, so we're really uh, deep into this workforce housing too, but that's a, that's a whole other subject. So here's, here, here's Serenby, you know, we're the first community and you have the 70% preservation, that's what it looks like. Uh, but you see here, we have, uh, here, here's LiveWorks. When we started this, we couldn't have LiveWorks. You know, that was the zoning. We you know, were afraid to have commercial with the residential and mix them across the street. So this intersection that's pictured here, across the street are, are single family houses, next to the intersection are attached houses. All kinds of things that I see outside here on the streets for buildings that were built 100 years ago. Yet this kind of zoning is illegal in almost every jurisdiction in this country today. You know, we have, are so afraid of having mixed use that we have sanitized, I think, the vitality out of where we live. The vitality just isn't there. And, and I think the pandemic has, has shown a lot of that's happened. Uh, so we, we have the real balance. and. It's attracting people from all over. The land plan really guides. So uh, we, 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 we look like a community from 100 years ago. We've been able to save trees within five feet of the foundation. You know, un unheard of that you can do that kind of thing. Uh, our streets curve. We don't allow lawns because I don't know how to have a, an, a uh, healthy community if I have lawns that have to have chemicals on them. The real estate community said you can't sell a house in the South without a lawn. Yet hardly anyone notices we don't have lawns. 
250 kids, not one reported case of asthma. Statistically impossible in the United States today. Uh, I think it's because we don't have chemicals uh, blowing the wind. You know, there's, we're sicker than we've ever been. Antidepressants have increased fourfold each decade, and we haven't even seen the reports from this last decade. And why are we keep doing the same thing? Beats me. It's got to change. We can't keep it up. This shows you where we have our farms. We've got our farms right up. Everyone thought farms were smelly and no one would live next to it. Organic farms aren't. Uh, this is the beginning. If you hear of agrihoods, this was the beginning. A New York reporter came to do a story on us and called it an agrihood and it sort of spawned a movement. Uh, and it's now the new golf. Uh, you can see the 70% preser preservation. Now, I can put anything agriculture, my farm, my equestrian center, that's all in my 70%. It's anything that's agriculture. You can forest. You can do anything. And we have done our land plan, so every house basically looks out the back door or is a few feet from a, a forest, a farm, a wildflower meadow, or a pasture. It's changed our kids. We have, you know, as I said, 250 kids. Some people in higher education stopped me about six months ago, and they said they were, they were there for the weekend, and they stopped to buy a lemonade stand, these girls, eight and nine years old. And they were so articulate on why they were selling. And so they noticed all the free-range kids we had. And so they took it upon themselves to talk to some of the other kids that they didn't see parents hovering. And they came back and they said, there's something different about your kids. And you think that if we can get the funding, your parent, the parents would agree we would like to do a 30-year study on the kids. Now, there's not many gray hairs here. But anyone with gray hair, chances are you grew up as a free-range kid no matter where you grew. You know? And today, that doesn't happen. Because our media makes everything that happens crime on children feel like it's in our backyard. Richard Louvre said there is a fraction of abuse on ch children today compared to the 1950s, yet we're fearful that it feels <coughs> much greater. Um, and it's affecting our kids and, and, and the development of them. Now this shows density. Uh, this is under development now. It's on a hillside, an area that you don't think you can build on. It's two acres going straight up the hill and it's 17 Fee simple units. They are selling for an amazing price. And just think, for every acre that's developed in this density, I'm saving 16 acres somewhere else. And that's, and people like the density. They're paying big money. They're moving from all over. Not just Metro Atlanta, we're getting people from major cities. This just doesn't happen that much, which just dumbfounds me uh, that this doesn't happen. So when you look at also community, in addition to the land plan, we have four pillars. Uh, agriculture, and I showed you the farms. Uh, the Rodale Institute, which is what, just an hour from here. I understand that you know, they have several farms here. They have now located their Southeast Research Center right next to me. My neighbor gave them 300 acres. And so we're at the, really the forefront of a lot of uh, the organic movement in restoring the soil. Uh, arts, we realize how important arts in. If you look in civilization, great places had patrons that supported the art. We have a 1% transfer fee for every house sold or resold, 3% if it's a vacant land. And that supports our arts programming. Last year, we put a million dollars into the Institute for Arts. Uh, Saturday night, we had a, a Broadway show from Broadway. We have uh, ballet. We have incredible arts that's coming to Serenby. Uh, health. Uh, w w our whole community, we're dealing with health. We have health professionals coming in, health retreats, and, and, and we're really on the forefront of dealing with, with uh, uh, how people are going to age in place. Uh, here again, you know, doing the right thing isn't regulated. We're, at, we're having to decouple it uh, to actually do, and we're, we're, we're dealing with some of the major medical institutions, uh, and uh, this year alone, three of, the, of your top Senior housing people have had think tanks at Serenby. Everybody's trying to figure this out because baby boomers aren't going to retire like our parents did. We don't like what we saw. 
I call them cruise ships to death. No matter how fancy they are, they're all headed in one place. Um, and then education, we're doing some great things in education. We have a charter school uh, that CBS Sunday morning was so amazed at, 500 kids, they came. A third of the day is spent outside. And uh, while test scores has, have, have improved, the big thing they're interested in was the uh, low absentee. Now this is pre-pandemic, but in Georgia, uh, 13 to 16 percent, depending on the area, uh, days were missed due to health. And at the school, it's rounded out to zero, it's so low. And the school nurse that came from the public school near us were 86, 96 percent of the kids are on free assisted lunch, so it gives you an idea. Several of those kids have come over to the charter school, and the nurse said, I saw those same kids three years ago, and they were legitimately sick, and they're legitimately not sick. Well, the medical journals show what connection nature does to the mind and, to the, and, and how it directly affects. And so here is a, a case on how simple it is. We worry about how we're going to fix some of these things. That's simple. We, built cot we could build classrooms in the woods. If it rains, guess what? The kids are going to get wet. They, you know, the rain gear is part of it. And they spend one third of the day outside. They're excited about education, and, and it, it changes their whole mental attitude. Um, we are, we're now building a, an Acton Academy on, on, on campus. Uh, it's a private school, so we're really in several areas of education and adult education as well. Uh, connection to nature is the key, as I said, and it shows you know, the health benefits. Uh, we're, we're hoping to get you know, insurance companies to really start looking at this, and, and, and if we start connecting the cost to our health system because of the way we've been building places, it'll start changing it. 20 years ago when we started this, everybody thought I was some tree-hugging liberal because of the environmental things. This was before LEED. Today, there's not a single Fortune 500 company that will not lease or own a, a, a building that's not certified. It's because they understand the energy savings and the health savings of being in those kinds of buildings. It's a, it's a dollar and cents issue, irregardless of where you stand on the environment. And that same thing needs to happen when we look at what it's costing us from the health system. In 1950, we spent 3% for gross national product on health. It's now at 30%, and if we don't change it, in another 20 years, it's going to be 50%. That's not going to work, y'all. We've got to change it. We've got to do something different. And a big piece of it is the built environment and what we continue to regulate enforcing developers to do the same old thing that's making us sick and depressed. And that's what really has to change. And this is happening. It's changing in various places. I don't know if you've heard about the Beltline, the Atlanta Beltline. It's changed Atlanta. And the real estate prices, parking lots that nobody was interested in are now some of the highest real estate in Atlanta. Uh, and people have activated. They're walking. They're healthier. They're biking. Uh, and now there are actually office buildings a, a Kroger supermarket, the front door faces the Beltline. You have to figure out where to park to get in and come around to the front door. It, it, it's totally changing uh, 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 too. The other big thing is stormwater, how we need to daylight stormwater. 20 years ago, I had to threaten e e uh, EPD that uh, I was going to uh, call a press conference because they were forcing me to do the wrong thing. This is when they were still requiring everything go in hard pipes. Uh, that regulation was changed some 12, 13 years ago, and now you're seeing people daylighting. In fact, I totally encourage the Parks Department and the, and the uh, Stormwater Department should all be under the same uh, department. Uh, too many times they're on opposite ends of the building and they don't even talk to each other. A lot of our stormwater infrastructure is deteriorating, and we should daylight it and make it open paths. Imagine what a difference it would be if we had these green networks through our city. You know, when you think about where does a raindrop that falls on your house make its way to the tributary in the river? Imagine if those were all daylighted and it would totally change. Uh, and so this is old Fourth Ward. They were going to uh, do this whole thing to change an area. Uh, a local architect said, let's look at the other way. Oh, no, we can't afford it. He got somebody to price it. They saved like $4 million. But the biggest thing is everything around it was all parking lots, and now what it's done to the tax base, I'm trying to get them to do a white paper on what that's done just to the tax base. It makes common sense. The national media, we, this simple place, 
in Georgia, just dealing common sense, we've hit most of the major. We had five pages in Time Magazine, Bloomberg, Oprah. Uh, I, I kind of can't believe it. It, it. It's exciting, and yet it's kind of depressing that we're so unusual when we're just doing simple things that make common sense. I love David Orr's comment that it makes better sense to reshape ourselves to fit the finite planet than to attempt to reshape the planet to fit our infinite wants, and that's kind of where we've been. This is a whole thing I just wanted to share with you because many people started looking at us, they want to put us in a box. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, you're one of the great new urbanists. Well, we are. Urban land ranks us in one of the 10 top new urbanist communities. But new urbanism isn't always environmental. ULI published a book years ago about the top 10 environmental communities, and we're one of those 10. We're the only one with density. And then I mentioned the, the agrihood, and we're in that, leading that. We're the only one in all three. So we realized we had to identify who we are. And so we're really leading the biophilic movement in, in, in development. Uh, and this is a lot to look at, but uh, th these are sort of the spheres of environmental stewardship and system management that really brings. And the results are personal well-being, community prosperity, national security, and global balance. National security, the whole thing I tell you about is Puck, who came out of the Pentagon, and he wrote, uh, the Grand Strategy. So if you're interested in more of that, look for that book, The Grand Strategy by uh, Puck Mickleby. Um, now remember those three little girls I told you about? Uh, Garney went to Cornell, the other two went to the University of Colorado, and they've all brought their northern husbands home. And so all the grandkids are now being raised on the streets of Serenby, and I get to see them almost every day. So uh, it, it, it's been a great ride. All right, so that's, uh, that kind of gives you the Serenby story. I don't know, if you, Bo, if you want any uh, questions, I, I may have worn everybody out there. So the two questions I had, Steve, um, you know, you mentioned when you were building Serenby, you stopped going to all the conferences, you stopped listening to the experts, the folks who had developed before, uh, they, they, all the development experts, they all told you you were crazy. Um, what you were doing, you were going in the wrong direction, it wasn't going to work. Uh, you know, from the, from the concept of a village in the middle of the woods, I know you opened a coffee shop when you had four residents there, or four homes there. Everyone told you you were crazy for that. Um, you know, the way that you were thinking about grading the land, they told you you were crazy. The way that you said, hey, I'm not going to disturb this whole forest to put in uh, storm water, they told you you were crazy. Um, how you handled everything, I think as I hear the Serenby story, the thing that I appreciate the most is you just kept asking, but why? Why not? Um, so I think a lot of this is because of the kind of professional silos that we have, the professional silos and their regulations that govern the built environment uh, in a way that doesn't allow us to see a comprehensive picture of, of how to build a sustainable community. So what's the solution to this siloing that we see uh, within the development landscape? I think, you know, I mean, for me, uh, I became passionate about saving our land. And I saw what that land meant to my family and my kids. And I never intended to be a developer. It was the last thing I wanted to do. I was totally comfortable. I was looking for somebody else to help me save the land. And somehow Ray Anderson pushed me through that, that threshold. And I look back, no wonder people thought I was crazy. But I think there's a, it, it's following your passion. Look around. And all you have to do is look at the younger generation. What kind of a world do we want to turn over? You know, I, I look at a lot of my life was because of the decisions my great-grandparents, grandparents made. And I certainly don't want 50, 100 years from now, my descendants to realize that I polluted and did not turn this over. Well, Ray Anderson said a great thing, or maybe I'm not sure where it came from, but you know, we, we, we do not, we did not inherit this land. 
we have borrowed it. And it's our responsibility to be better stewards. And I think if we just think of that, rather than just doing what we can get it done, it, it gives you a whole different philosophy that you realize you have to do it differently, even if it's hard. Leads really into the next question I have. Uh, let me pull this up. It, it also reminds me of this quote. I think I've quoted Wendell Berry in every single speaker series we've had, so we'll continue that. He has this quote where he says, and I think it's applicable to this as well. He says, the genius of the American farm experts is very well demonstrated here. They can take one solution and divide it neatly into two problems. And that's, that's what I see in the development world. We take one solution of something that works. We knew it worked for thousands of years, and somehow we create two problems out of that. Uh, but the question I had is, as you were getting to um, kind of future generations, um, so Steve, I'm 31, as we mentioned earlier. Um, as I talked to my friends, we were meeting with my friend Tom is here earlier. You know, as I talk to my friends about the world that we're living in, we feel like we're living in a wasteland, like truly in a wasteland. There's something profoundly wrong. Um, we have the relics of beautiful places around us, but live in a culture that lacks the confidence to build beautiful places. We, we just don't feel like we can do it once again. We feel like we're living among a different set of people that had to exist before us that could build these places and we can't do it today. We also see, and in, in to be bold here, we see the selfishness of older generations. This is something I talk to my friends about a lot. With incredible wealth, we see older generations making decisions that benefit them today, but have really bad consequences on the future. To, to share just two examples, I've seen in our surrounding townships, um, older generations preserving land that has no public access. You know, this is municipal money, sometimes debt going, that debt is gonna be handed off to future generations to preserve land that younger generations will not have access to. We have a housing crisis. You know, we need to think about better strategies for this. How are we dealing with this? That's one. And in our boroughs and townships, we see a lot of opposition to new development. And we all get it. I mean, I get it. it I would share the same kind of crisis moment of seeing the bulldozer and saying, oh no, new development's coming. I don't wanna see new development. I think we all see that. It goes back to the lack of confidence we have. Um, but even thoughtful development is opposed. You know, when people bring something similar to Sarah B, it's opposed. Uh, and this is with municipalities that, you know, whether they're struggling financially today, whether their budgets meet, you know, you shared some of that. Um, you know, a lot of our townships, if we go out and we discussed this in previous speaker series, if we go out 20 years, they're financially insolvent, and yet they're opposing development today. All of this is going to be handed off to my generation and those younger than me. Um, last point on this is, you know, we have, I, I know a developer that's building structural masonry homes, and he said he's, he's doing this because somewhere between you know, his kid's generation and his great grandkid's generation, we're going to have to rebuild everything that we've built in America, and we're gonna be living in a far poorer world with far less resources. So how, give me hope, and as, how would you respond to this as, as someone of my age, how, how do we think about this? Well, there's two things I think about. Um, you know, being, leading the baby boom generation. In the 60s, we were gonna change the world through love and happiness. And my same generation became the greedy generation of the 80s and 90s. And I'm hoping that more of us, as we have found our success, uh, come back in that pendulum and start taking responsibility for the mess we've made. And you just have to look around, it is. But, but few people have stepped into that and few people realize it because it's what I call rut thinking. And you know, when you get deep enough in the rut, you don't even realize that it's a rut because everything you see is the walls of that thinking. And we've gotten there through fear because we're afraid and so all of our very strict regulation is it's all this protectionist attitude that we're gonna protect everybody. And actually, if you look at it, what are we protecting them from? Why not let it be a little bit loose? Why not bring vitality back into where we are? Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I hope that the statistics are starting to show and those that have been in the rut 
the financial market is going to pull them out of it because the younger generation is not buying that old method. And I think the pandemic, you, you look what's happening. People are reanalyzing where they want to live. It's changed. The market is going to change. Uh, they, they, if, if you're in the office market, read certification, you know, it, the pros and cons of it. It has changed that market. You do not build rental property anymore unless it's certified. Uh, that's going to happen with the housing as the market changes and people that are building the same old stuff aren't going to be able to sell them and, it, and it's going to change. You know, I think, I think about that too. I remember when my daughter graduated from Cornell, the speaker, and I wish I could remember his name. He, he was the president. It was his last year. And he told the graduating class, he says, you're all filled with optimism. Boy, I see that. You know, 30, you're, you're getting that, hit. you've been out of school just long enough. <laughs> and he said, you're all believe you're going to change the world on your white horses. Be careful. He says, you will gradually take a step into the dark side. Because regulation, financial, there are all reasons, and you won't even recognize yourself in 30, 40 years if you're not careful. And it's not one step that you made intentionally. It just happens. And I think that's the state we're in. It's too many people in, in, in development, medical, I don't care what the industry, has stepped over to the dark side between fear and greed. And it's not left a very good place for the future generation. And we've got to change it. That's why I'm coming to talk to people like you. So when we pa when we pa we passed an overlay in 2002, with the agreement that we would change the zoning to, to match the the land use, Fulton County paid for that, and that was passed at the end of 2002. Uh, then state law in 2003 for transfer development rights, and we broke ground in 2004. We so inspired this community to take charge of their own destiny. So it was an overlay at that point within Fulton County. In 2006, we filed to become our own city. And that was granted and voted, 80% voted uh, in that November election. And so in 2007, we stood up our own municipality. So we're now a municipality within Fulton County, but we're also across the county line in Coweta. So our city can now annex into the other four counties that are right there. And so Serenby, we have land that is in both Fulton and Coweta, but it's all in the city of Chad Hills. Well, well I mean, so within the city, the 40,000 acres, that's just whoever owned it still owns it. We, they just have different zoning laws that they have to deal with. In our development, we, we have a, it's, it's fee simple mostly, except for some mixed uses, uh, rental, and it's, it's um, we have a, an HOA that, that guides that. Uh, we try to keep the regulations to common sense, but as we get bigger, there's a lot, you know, sometimes it's, it's not always respect and common sense, so, you know, we now have leash laws if you're on the streets, but if you're open, uh, you know, we have 19 miles of, of trails out in the open there. So it's, uh, it, it functions very much like any other place. It just feels very different. Does that answer your question? What's our mix? Uh, he, he understands the, the uh, price you're getting on residential units, but how does commercial and some of those perform? So commercial and even industrial, as you mentioned, so office and things like that. Yeah. 
so we, you know, we, we've had limited because the market wasn't there. And so uh, uh, when I wanted to build, gosh, four years ago, five years ago, a 23,000 square foot office building, uh, and I wanted to focus on a medical, uh, again, the bankers laughed at me. You know, you think, hey, we've got all these million dollar houses, we have no trouble getting those evaluated. What, you know, why can't you go with offices? And we have a few offices, some co-works, but nothing to that scale. Well, I had to sell my last acre on uh, Peachtree Street in Midtown to build that myself. It was totally leased uh, at, uh, by the time we opened. And we are now on, uh, on renewals, both in the live work. So now also there's now 10, six more under, con uh, under construction, 16 live works. That's the, the, the street retail. And they're starting to get new leases around $40 a square foot. You know, maybe places like Serenby isn't for everyone, but they're just my market. There's not many competitors. So people are paying, whether it's houses, whether it's retail, no matter where we open. Uh, and, and developers now around the country are starting to catch on. And so you're going to see more of it. Because you can own a market if you go into a place and do something new and different. And this is why what's going to change is people catching on to this. It's going to make economic sense. You know, I don't think you ever change things because of do good. Uh, or, or just a few crazy people like me, but it was it, it was economic, and that's what's going to change it. trying to share what we're doing by talking. We have developers bringing their uh, city councilor commissioners and their banker. We have commissioners and city councils bringing their developers. So, you know, back when we were doing this, I had to go to Europe to find what we wanted, and now Serenby is that place. Uh, we, we have a podcast, Serenby Stories. We have the Biophilic Solutions, so it's two podcasts. So. People can go and see this whole series of subjects you can look at. Uh, and we have Nigrin Consulting, and, and we're helping from uh, the Duke and Duchess in Fife over in Scotland to the heirs to Johnson & Johnson in, in Costa Rica to FLIPA in Australia. Uh, we just, you know, if you know uh, uh, the Hudson Valley, uh, Hyde Park, how strict those regulations are. We were able to work with that developer on the 350 acres right across from the Culinary Institute in doing things they didn't think they could get past because it was so hard they wanted to stick with a plan. And they're really going to be there. I think they're, they, they, they've gotten approvals and they're moving forward. So even in places that's really strict, if you really sit down and look at the options and look at what can happen, most people will see it, but it's just real easy to say no first. And so there's good examples out there. And, uh, and, and I'm amazed. I mean. Oh, last week, we had five different development groups, two busloads uh, that, that came to Serenby. You know, Franklin, Tennessee, they loaded people in. They drove, what, I don't know how many hours that is. Uh, and they spent two days in the metro area, but they spent a whole day at Serenby. And that was the bankers, that was the developers, that was the, their, their, their mayor, their uh, planner. And, and I've gotten several notes that it's, they're making change. They've gone home and they're making change. Because if we don't see it, we don't understand it. And there's very little place because everybody's been doing the same thing. We have uh, a handout that you can see in the back uh, that has kind of inspiration for how you can get involved in encouraging better development, but it also has the, the first step, as we say, is inspiration. And so it has a list of inspiring development similar to Serenby uh, from across the country. So be sure to pick that up. 
Any other questions? If not, I have one closing one. Any other? <laughs> Go ahead, right here. Well, remember, we, we, we landed in an area that couldn't support itself. So we have had lots of affordable housing. The little village next to us, which about 2,700 people, is where 80 or 96 percent of the kids are on free assisted lunch. Our area didn't need workforce housing, but with all the jobs we're bringing in, we have pretty well used up the, the workforce housing. How much time do we have? <laughs> so this is a whole thing. What is the right thing to do is currently illegal. Our affordable housing in America is dependent on you, the taxpayer, and private industry is not only incentivized to do something about it, we are blocked from doing it. And no one's putting all these dots together. And that's a whole other subject. We're right in the middle of it. I couldn't believe I've, I, you know, I've hit another roadblock. Seems like even when we start to do this thing. So I start calling Washington, I call it it. So we've had Fannie Mae, we've had the Urban Land Institute, and yeah, they've formed, yeah, guess what? The, the, the ski places in Colorado, everybody's been dealing with this. Well, why aren't we changing some of these rules and regulations? And we're continuing, we're not gonna get the workforce housing and affordable housing in our neighborhood if we keep doing it through taxes and foundations. It's the same thing with no place could, could save 70% of the land. It costs too much money. We've got to change workforce housing. Workforce housing, senior housing is broken and we're, we're gonna change it. Real quick on that, can you touch on, uh, this was my kind of closing question. I saw we had one more, but can you touch on just the diversity of price points within Serenby? So you, you know, you talked about um, workforce housing, affordable housing, but within the community, the diversity there. Within the f community, I mean, we've got, of course, my goodness, what's happening now in this last, that last year, you know, it, it, it's kind of hard to understand. Uh, I mean, we had going in, into this last year, we, you know, we were putting some of our smaller uh, 900 square foot houses, they came on the market right in uh, high threes, low fours. They've all, you know, they're reselling much more. Uh, you know, we have, we have just started with our uh, spec builders building million dollar spec houses because they did one for a million three and it sold uh, within an hour of going on the market. So they decided, hey, th th this is something. Uh, so we're getting um, million and a half, two million dollar spec houses. Uh, we have some houses that are six million. Uh, and when you drive down the community, you don't notice. It, you know, the, the million dollar houses aren't down one area and one hamlet. It's all mixed together. Uh, we I have one intersection. It was I took five quarter acre lots in the middle of the recession, designed 900 square foot houses, put them in a village, changed what was going to be five lots into 16 lots, and uh, that that's we started moving out of the recession in 2010 through that. But that's across the street from some a, a row of the quarter acre, and a half acre what we call a state lot. So here you have a complete mix. And when you drive down the street, you don't even think about it until you stop and look at that mix. So it's, uh, here's another thing. Our zoning codes generally, this cul-de-sac has this price and that price or that builder and it's so segregated and it, it's not very exciting. Where are they what? Where do they get stuck? Well, generally zoning codes is your first place and your second place is the financial community. And that's your big stick. Uh, you know, in, in places that have had a uh, local government that understands the wisdom, you know, there's, you know, there, there's council presidents, there's chairman of the planning boards around this country that are championing this but they're running into a financial uh, community that's still looking out the rear view mirror because you have to have a feasibility study before you get the money. And we just got to change that. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure what that solution is, 
but it's, it, it's, it's causing us to keep doing the same thing that all the statistics show don't work. Uh, you know, the only thing I know is, is, is what's happened with commercial real estate on environmental. You know, the bankers finally understood that, that this made common sense and actually they won't fund it if it isn't certified because they know what it does to the market and the appraisal. That hasn't happened on residential or retail yet. All right. Perfect. If there's anything you were uh, didn't want to ask publicly, I'm happy to uh, answer you privately. Let's give it up for Steve. See the see the handout that we have in the back uh, for inspiration on how you can kind of encourage this. I think one important note that is different from Georgia and what Steve's talking about, and I'm from Georgia. A lot of the decisions in Georgia are made at the, in the South in general, are made at the county level. Here it's very localized, uh, which in some ways is good, in some ways is not good, uh, but it does mean that local citizens can have a huge role in kind of shaping what happens at their local level. Uh, and so we have a pamphlet in the back that is kind of encouragement on how you can be involved with that. But thank you all.